you go. Lovely. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the second event in this term's alumni lecture series. It's really lovely to see that so many of you have joined us today. My name's Sophie Schermacher, and I'm Alumni Relations Officer at Green Templeton. Uh, before we begin, I've just got one or two bits of housekeeping to run through. Please note the event is recorded, so you'll be able to watch again at your leisure. You'll be sent a link to the recording later this week. Um, you'll be muted during the event, but we will be holding a Q&A at the end of John's talk, so we will ask you to submit questions uh, via the chat box. Now, we do have some pre-submitted questions, so thank you very much to those of you who have submitted questions, but we can't guarantee we'll be able to answer all the live questions, however, we will do our best. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce John O'Lone. John is an alumnus of Green Templeton, starting his Master's in Consulting and Coaching for Change in 2003, and after leaving his native Australia over 30 years ago, has had a trailblazing career leading media organisations in the UK and around the world. Responsible for the launch of Sky News, he's worked with more than 40 leading channel and media brands on their strategy, creativity and business development. John will draw on his experience in the media industry during his talk, The Media Matrix, in which he'll discuss the evolution of power in the media as a function of technology, invention, and regulation. Over to you, John. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, thanks for having me. And thank you all for uh, joining us from wherever you are. And I hope engaging with uh, some great questions, which we'll take at the end. Uh, ben, you can submit those online as they occur to you uh, as we go along. Uh, we already have some very interesting questions from various people when they logged in. Uh, so the last part of this hour should be extremely uh, stimulating. At least uh, I'll do my best. We often think of the balance in the media meaning giving due emphasis to both sides or as many sides as may be relevant. Uh, with complete impartiality, or that the power of the government needs to be offset and balanced by the power of the media. So to challenge the power of the government and others, the media must also have some power of itself. That's how democracy is safeguarded, which is why to reduce the media's influence is to damage democracy, as we'll see as we go along. It'd be quite a utopia, if not a simplistic world, to live in with everything in relative harmony running like clockwork because the reality is, as we know, everything that makes up the weight in the scales is not consistent. Uh, there are too many consistent parts to have any hope of achieving a balance of power without taking the rest of the players into account because they'll all become stronger or weaker, more significant or less significant as time and circumstances move on. So mass media does not live in a vacuum. It's part of a system of many parts, which can be disrupted at any time, usually, as we'll see here, by the invention of uh, new technology. And this technology usually has the purpose of uh, changing and increasing the reach of the particular type of media that it was designed to serve. Uh, which in turn create new, creates new channels of distribution for content uh, that the old means of distribution were possibly already providing as we see as we go along. And other new and creative ways of expressing that content in a way that's uh, far easier for consumers to appreciate uh, or to buy or to access. Uh, new technology disrupts the established players uh, who'd rather not have their established position challenged uh, so that we see that in the mass media, is, it's just a part of a system uh, that begins with the invention of new technology, which ultimately turns out to be just another way of distributing content, which, as we'll see, is usually even pretty much the same content. Because, there we are, we're going back to 1693. The ladies' Mercury newspaper hit the streets of London on 27th of February, 1693. So 328 years ago this month, I'll repeat that, that's 328 years ago, uh, promising it would be about 
the nice and curious questions concerning love, marriage, behavior, dress, and humor of the female sex, whether virgins, wives, or widows. Now, if that isn't the storyline for every East Enders episode we've uh, been um, graced with, uh, since we were first invited to uh, Albert Square on the BBC on the evening of 19th of February, 1985, almost exactly 292 years later, or Coronation Street even, 25 years before that, it all must have been a JR type dream because the nice and curious questions of uh, back then were still the same questions that were being asked in print uh, and even up until today, I took these from uh, 2014 because they seem to be the most interesting or they made the better point. But obviously, it's not a dream. Uh, it's the same storylines with different covers. It took 200 years for Gothenburg's original invention to be turned to a mass media purpose. In the English speaking world, when the London Gazette was first published in 1666, then the Daily Current launched in 1702. Today's Sun claims to have a direct uh, links to the current, the first publisher of which promised to avoid giving any comments or conjectures of his own, supposing other people to have the sense enough to make reflections for themselves, which if you transfer that into today's parlance is we report, you decide, and they're still using it today, although Fox the News launched in October 1996. At that time, uh, back when um, the uh, Daily Current launched in 1702, there were 12 newspaper circulation in London, uh, with a population then in London of 600,000, another 24 provincial papers for an English population of, or a population in England of uh, five and a half million with a literacy rate of about 60%. That meant that there were 36 newspapers for a readership of three and a half million. That's a bit like having 750 news outlets for 65 million people, which is about what we've got today. So having so many news outlets reporting on different things is uh, no new thing. Through most of uh, Prince for centuries of slow technological development from the Middle Ages to modern times, freedom of speech and freedom of the press grew with democracy as important principles under which Britain was governed. All the laws specifically concerning the press were abolished by 1855, so that by then only laws restricting the press media, which were not unlike many other laws governing normal commerce, um, we're concerned with monopoly and competition. Now, here I add that uh, firstly, the development of the press in Britain was mirrored quite closely in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, I won't go into those details because there isn't time. It's the principle I'm working on here that as you'll see, there is a parallel through all of this and society. That initially technology gives us the innovation of a new means of distribution that perhaps not dissimilar content which may well tell a universal and broadly similar story, no matter what its technology or delivery mechanism uh, down through the ages. But at the early stages of technical development, uh, it's left pretty much alone to deliver content to its intended audience, which is us with uh, adapted relevancy. So whether it's the newspapers, the cinematograph, the wireless, uh, the televisor, it's a characteristic of the media matrix that new invention is left to itself to deliver an apparently new form of content to the audience. That is until it starts to become popular because that's when the government and uh, other regulation become involved. The BBC monopoly of the airways in Britain grew quickly Within three years, it was estimated that 40 million people were listening in on a regular basis, many more than were buying and reading newspapers, and also enough to cause potential problems at the local cinemas. In contrast to the slow development within the press media for the previous 200 years or more, uh, the first law regarding the electronic media was passed by the British Parliament in 1904. Within four years, of the new technology becoming available and more particularly becoming popular. The Wireless Telegraphy Act set a pattern for uh, 
British and worldwide electronic media regulation. And to operate the regulation, they needed an organization to see that the regulation carried out those requirements. So we still have technology getting straight through to content there uh, with soft touch regulation and soft touch organization. And here's why the BBC's first chief engineer, Peter Eckersley had no illusion as to why his organization, the BBC is a monopoly was necessary. The BBC was founded as the expedient solution of a technical problem, he said. It owes its existence solely the scarcity of wavelength uh, to stop radio waves from different transmitters in different parts of the country or in different countries from interfering with one another. The only interference newspaper distributors had then was the newspaper sellers themselves brawling in the streets and setting fire to one another's copies. But we had laws of the land to police that. This early technical problem with radio, however, required a regulatory and organizational solution, which we can see there. The early British metrics looked a bit like this, where regulation and organization gradually became more important in the media mix, while technology and uh, content uh, were of less relevance to the whole system working. This British solution would determine what the content would be, in fact. Uh, the foundation of the public service broadcasting monopoly, which was to serve the country for 30 years, was originally in response to the unsolved technical difficulty, which became solvable. Uh, so we can see here that while the technology of radio was still connecting directly to its audience, government and regulation had gained a relative uh, power greater than what the medium was providing, enough to control both the technology and the output. What the media metric contends is that within the media balance of power, one corner can only gain power at the expense of the other or the others, uh, as we'll see in a minute, as uh, government and even market intervention in the form of vested interest, market interest, the existing laws of the land, such as defamation and even health and safety, uh, combined to form regulators to police those interventions in the opposite corners, technology and intervention, uh, invention. And in the opposing corner, the audience, that's where we are, down in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, and the mass market, as part of the mass market, uh, to become weaker in influence as to what we're going to get via the medium. In 1951 in Britain, Lord Beveridge was called upon to launch the sixth major investigation into British broadcasting in 30 years. In the peacetime years since John Reith walked into his Savoy Hill office to inaugurate the BBC at the end of 1922, up to the start of the Beveridge inquiry in 1951, taking out the war years, there had been an average of one major government inquiry into British broadcasting media every 36 months and there were even more behind closed doors. Uh, by contrast, the development of radio and later television in the United States sees a lighter touch government and regulatory intervention, strengthening the role of technology in the mass market. By the time British viewers living in just a small part of North London were being treated to just one EMI Marconi and Logie Baird dual system television experiment, Almost 30 television transmitters were already listed in the April 1936 edition of the Shortwave Listener's Handbook uh, across the United States. So there was already a clear difference in the speed of development in the nature of intent in driving development on either side of the Atlantic and around the world. One was in funding, unlike the American radio manufacturers, the British manufacturing companies uh, didn't have to spend money to produce content on the radio stations or networks because RCA and the other Westinghouse uh, manufacturers of radio set up networks to play music and provide games and news and so on so that they could sell their radio sets. That didn't happen here. Uh, the British electronics companies didn't have to spend money to produce the content to sell their receiving sets because they had the BBC. The government undertook to do that for them, but they charged the public for it. So we were paying for distribution of the radio anyhow. The tension in early play between the opposing forces, uh, the adjacent corners, 
in some places resulted in the direction of the flow of energy being diverted, not in the natural flow, but by the strongest influences in the mix. Totalitarian regimes with powerful governments in Beijing and Moscow and elsewhere were able to divert all distribution via themselves towards the audience through their organizations, which of course had disastrous consequences for uh, the freedom of speech. Now I'll come back to that later, but point it out now as an example of how powerful influences can distort the natural running of the matrix and how we can see it coming and how we can avoid it. Remember too that it was the government that the young Marconi originally went to when he arrived in London looking for help to start his transmitting station in what would have been a government power centric reverse S shift as we see here rather than the one we have today where you can see the energy moves through basically the government and other regulators uh, set up by the government. So we then out of that melange, uh, get the content that we can uh, enjoy or not. Examples uh, in communist countries were closer to the centralized British system, but with strong enough government and regulatory interference to reverse the natural flow of power. Now that's what the media matrix at rest looks like. It's actually a pretty complex conundrum when you look more deeply into it, as we will here, which we don't have time to do today because uh, it is a bit complex, other than to take away the idea that as one or two corners get stronger or weaker, so the other corners in the matrix will react, suggesting it works within a closed system of influence. I mentioned scenario building a moment ago, that's where I think the media matrix moves from the history department to the strategy department, because we then start to look at the future. The qualifying of the power of one, two or three of those corners, by knowing, by quantifying the power of one, two or three of those corners, we should be able to predict what's going to happen to the fourth one based on what normally happens and what we've seen happen over the centuries uh, consistently. So whenever there's been an invention leading to new forms of distribution and mass media opportunities, the system indicated for the four corners of the matrix can be proved to hold true. So as you'll notice from this chart, there's an elephant in the room and he or she is having trouble maintaining the balance of the media, the, the, the balance that the media matrix needs to work with. It's the World Wide Web, would you believe? It seems to have been with us for almost all our lives. And for a steadily increasing number of people, it has been with them all their lives. But Google, for argument's sake, has only been with us for just uh, 22 years. Within 24 months, the company that uh, came into the world, um, I'll just move that on, in the top left-hand corner there, with the motto, don't be evil, spent $50,000 a year in lobbying in Washington when it first started. That's less than uh, a grand a week, uh, which would hardly buy you a clipping service. So they were very shortly after they came into existence, were concentrating on their content, concentrating on the market, concentrating on the audience and didn't give uh, a lot of uh, attention to uh, regulation of the government and organization. However, eight years later, they were spending over $18 million on lobbying. Uh, they've cut back a bit now, but they've increased uh, their direct appeals to the public. So here we can see a maturing situation in which the scenario would indicate with curbs looming on what new technology can do, even while the smoke of the candles of their 21st birthday party is still in the air, uh, they got the message and started to join the matrix. Technology's aim has always been to drive a direct path to the content it could create and distribute to a mass market. Subsequent regulation and then organizations set up to police the regulations have fought to interrupt such direct access to audience and markets. That's why we have a free media. 
as Facebook starts to get stronger, as it face, starts to exude even greater power in its top left-hand corner, or is it in the bottom right-hand corner as well? They don't seem to know. Um, something has gone wrong here. Ah, we can see that they're not even sure they're publishers, uh, but they believe that they're still in the top left-hand corner as a technology company, but they're coming now to the conclusion that they are possibly publishers after all, in which is what Nick Clegg, uh, Nick Clegg is, in, is insisting that it's neither a publisher nor a utility, and then therefore it shouldn't be regulated as either, and what he's basically saying, or what Facebook is saying, they shouldn't be regulated at all. Uh, but as we will find elsewhere, there's also the fight on about whether these uh, social media companies should also be classified as publishers, uh, which is why there is uh, a probe restarted in the UK into uh, their involvement in the advertising industry. And in Australia, there is a uh, ongoing battle between a, a Google and the government uh, about paying for content. We also have uh, the instance of uh, Twitter um, realizing, and we will come to this, I think, in questions in a minute, uh, realizing that they definitely are part of society, that they definitely are part of the media metrics, but they, of course, are uh, holding out for as long as they can to not be part of the metrics, but we have seen uh, in other industries, in other times, uh, and by other uh, by other other means, the scenario is that we know where the technology is now. We know what the regulation intention is. We know what the organisation is. So we now know how there that they there will come a day in not not too distant future where uh, social media will also be brought under the. Uh, under the uh, influence of the uh, of the way the system has always worked, uh, and hopefully not this. So the technology, like uh, Facebook, like Twitter, etc., doesn't get too close to regulation because then we'll find that we are, uh, as the audience, uh, as uh, free press, um, as the market, we are uh, an afterthought of uh, a whole system operating above us. Which brings us to the next part of uh, the matrix, where we jump off the, the history, where we jump off what it was like up until the front cover of Cosmo or even uh, what was on the news last night uh, and into the future. A wave of censorship that seeks to silence conversation, to stifle debate, to ultimately stop individual societies from realizing their potential. Too many people have fought too hard in too many places for freedom of speech to be suppressed. Now, the person who said that just last week was Rupert Murdoch. What he was talking about was this. So what we are looking for are curves through the matrix. Obviously, technology and regulation need a two-way uh, two conversation. Obviously, organizations in the content need uh, a two-way organization. Uh, but the strength still remains in technology distribution, providing uh, easily accessible content uh, to the market with uh, regulation organization playing a part, but not a, uh, an unduly significant part. So while we're looking for curves through the matrix, which protect us, so we've seen the consistency of media and technology to react in much the same way in the media power shift from the start of invention and new technology. Now, how does this work with society itself? Because we've been talking here about a closed, uh, a closed system. A recent report, which uh, was last week uh, about people involved uh, to pick up uh, some of the assumptions that we can see in the media matrix um, scenarios. An international research team, including researchers from the University of Exeter, 
recently created a new database of historical and archaeological information using data on 414 societies spanning the last 10,000 years. A bit further back than the media matrix has gone, but it does help to explain the consistency of the outcome of new media technology and how it's used by society, because they found that despite their many differences, societies tend to become more complex in highly predictable ways. Uh, to paraphrase, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, the uh, debate is larger and more systematic than anything that has gone before. Their database, I'm sorry is larger and more systematic than is anything that's gone before. According to Dr. Thomas Curry of the Human Behavior and Cultural Exchange Group, Evolution Group at the University of Exeter's Penryn campus, societies involve along a bumpy path, sometimes breaking apart, but the trend is towards larger and more complex arrangements. And he adds, Researchers have long debated whether social complexity can be meaningfully compared across different parts of the world. Our research suggests that similar surface differences occur, but there are fundamental similarities in the way societies evolve, which parallels with the way we have seen the media evolve uh, from, from when it first started. Uh, to which I think we can add the way our media evolves, as I said, as well as where the power lies, which brings us to how well the metric may manage to give us some scenarios for the future. As we've seen, there are fundamental similarities in the way societies and social complexities evolve. And we've also seen via different evidence that the use of mass media in those societies has great similarities and has for centuries no matter what form of message distribution was being used. The reliability of this happening in the mass media for more than a century and a half and further, with each new significant development and in every part of the world points to a closed system of operation with predictable results from which we can make certain estimates on future development. It's as simple as that. The matrix tells us that we are most likely to see strong control of the excesses of the media, which will include some censorship in the public interest. But as we've also, as we also know too, too many, too much censorship can create uh, a backlash. It wasn't CNN or Sky News that brought the Berlin Wall down with satellite transmissions of news reports over the top of the Iron Curtain, although they helped. It was J.R. Ewing in Dallas, the 1980s soap opera offering a life of luxury that the people behind the Iron Curtain could only dream about. Uh, the storylines, which were very similar to those proposed uh, promised by the Ladies Mercury of 1693 that created uh, the social discontent uh, on top of economic chaos. And then the walls came down because all four corners of the matrix are in constant tension with what you could call their natural allies in their diagonal corners, but in conflict with the forces closest to them. There'll never be for that reason, a perfect resting place. The 1928, uh, 1918 movie, Bellingcat, the truth in a post-truth world, explores the promise of open source investigation, taking viewers inside the real life world of the citizen journalist collectively known as Bellingcat. In an age when governments spread fake news to cause confusion and uncertainty, even the truth is hard to find. While news organizations still check facts using their own sources, clever internet users are discovering that there are also smarter and more accurate ways to get to the truth. Finding the truth of the MH17 uh, air crash, 
for example, using Google Earth, the dash cam footage and Facebook profiles or atrocities in Syria by checking videos for authenticity and storing for possible future prosecutions. Even the truth behind the Schiphol uh, poisoning, Bellingcat have been able to do all that by operating within the way the media has been allowed to develop. But we have to hope that the reverse S curve that I was uh, looking at before, even though there is the backlash, the backlash has always been proved of any media anywhere, has always been proved to, if there is overreaction, you lose uh, your opportunity to be told the truth or find the truth. If there is um, compromise, which the uh, metrics calls for, we will normally uh, get to the truth and allow the truth to get to us. Because if the matrix isn't allowed to work, we're going to get to a stage that Homer Simpson foresaw a long time ago. There's an old saying that uh, we deserve the politicians we get. And likewise, we deserve the media we get. So I think now it's uh, time for questions. Thank you so much, John. That was absolutely fascinating and, and so interesting to, to, to see across history how things have progressed. Um, we'll go to the pre-submitted questions now. So the first one we have, will the new GB News swing Britain to the right? Why or why not? Well, um, you'd have to watch it first to find out, I think. That's presupposing that uh, a lot of the publicity that has uh, come before it, because it has not yet happened, uh, turns out to be true. Uh, I have no way of knowing whether it's going to turn out to be true or not. Uh, if, it, if the publicity, if the way it's being pushed, uh, primarily in the newspapers, or possibly only in the newspapers, um, turns out to be correct, uh, it's still a long shot to say it's going to push Britain further to the right. Um, it's arguable that uh, even when Fox News started, I would argue that even when Fox News started, there was already an audience there that uh, Fox News discovered either by accident or by, uh, by design. Um, and the same thing I think is uh, GB News is likely to find here. Uh, that I don't think it'll push us any further to the right. Uh, but I think it will give a voice to people who may feel that they haven't been listened to in the past, uh, which to go back to what I was just talking about before is, is quite dangerous. Uh, if people don't feel that, uh, if they feel they're being censored, they will find other ways uh, to, uh, to have their uh, voices heard, uh, not through the media. Uh, so I think it's, impos it's important that... Um, that we have uh, multiplicity of voices uh, and that uh, even under the Ofcom regulations uh, that uh, we allow, I wouldn't say as Chairman Mao once said, a hundred flowers bloom because that started riots. Uh, but it, um, I would say that uh, free speech requires people being able to speak freely. Thank you, totally agree, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the next question, how can the investigative freedom of the media, together with its freedom of expression, be maintained whilst at the same time restricting the dissemination of spurious or fictitious material masquerading as evidence-based fact? Um, how can investigative freedom be maintained? Well, uh, firstly, through resources, uh, firstly, through uh, having more uh, news organizations willing to go and do it, uh, firstly, by uh, organizations such as Bellingcat. Um, and as I said, the more people you have looking for different stories, the more different stories you're going to have. That will answer part of the question. Um, the, what the question's not, we're talking about spurious or fictitious material. I think 
uh, as the Daily Current uh, editor had it uh, back in 1766, whatever the year was, that uh, one would presume that people are smart enough to know uh, for themselves what is um, what stacks up and what doesn't stack up. I think we're going through a period now where people are deliberately uh, coming out with falsehoods uh, for the sake of... Um, of uh, wrong footing the uh, population as um, Sun Tzu would have had it even further back than I'd gone that it's better to um, wrong foot your uh, enemy than uh, than shoot them uh, I think that's happening a lot now we're entering a uh, an era where on the one hand um, forces that would wish to unbalance our uh, societies uh, have the opportunity to do it uh, but then at the same time, uh, forces such as Bellingcat and others also have the same opportunity, if not possibly the same resources to start with, uh, to uh, try and balance those, um, uh, those uh, other uh, sources um, and dispel uh, the spurious or fictitious material. Uh, so I think, it's an, I think the problem is, is again, if we censor too many things, uh, people will become suspicious. They won't believe the media anymore. And once you that happens, uh, you actually have uh, anarchy of intellect, I suppose you could call it, or anarchy of, uh, um, of stability. Um, it will continue providing uh, the, the matrix can be balanced, I guess is my best answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one we have is how can the media, the fourth estate, use the technology at their disposal to balance the increasing power of non-democratic democratic regimes? Well, I mentioned before the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall was uh, not only brought about by CNN and Sky News and others uh, broadcasting via satellite over the top of the, uh, of the wall into, uh, into those regimes. It was also by even just uh, the videotapes of Dallas that used to circulate in the, um, in the church halls on a uh, Sunday night after mass, uh, all had something to do with, uh, and the largest part of course was the crumbling economy, but these all added to um, uh, balance the increasing power of the non-democratic regimes. Um, whether it was uh, the European Endowment for Democracy, which was running a, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it an operation, but was running a project to uh, try and balance uh, some of the uh, more Kremlin-inspired uh, um, news reports in the Balkan states and the French states that used to be the, uh, the Soviet satellite states, uh, to uh, Radio Free Europe. Um, these things are being done, but I think the main problem is not so much as uh, putting that information back into those countries uh, as it is um, making sure that those people with, uh, I don't used to use a, a, a uh, ingenuous intent, um, don't have uh, the opportunity to, um, uh, to, cre up the, cre to corrupt the uh, freedom of media that we have here. one if you're a twitter ceo would you ban trump what's the boundary of the power of the internet and media companies uh if well i'm, I'm not going to well if i was the ceo of twitter i would be there by virtue of my background and by virtue of my background i would have put in play uh safeguards prior to uh, those inflammatory uh, remarks that Trump had made. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't ban it, but I would, uh, I would have moderated it by now. And uh, what I would suggest is that is what is going to happen it is th that it is going to be moderated. I think what happened was well, the reason he was banned originally it was first it was because the situation just grew out of proportion, grew out of control. Whereas if it had have been uh, moderated all the way along, that wouldn't have been necessary. And I think they realise that now. Mm. Well, there is a realisation with that now. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'd be very interested in your thoughts on the future of podcasts. What do you think the business model of it could be? Look, uh, podcasts are um, 
one of the big technological breakthroughs uh, of the era. Um, they are the video on demand radio, um, which it's, uh, it is like radio, but you can take it with you and you can use it. It's in bite-sized chunks and so on. Uh, there are, um, there's a big future for podcasts. Uh, the business model uh, ultimately will be one of the problems with business models generally in this uh, internet world is there's so much of it, it's very hard to charge. Uh, I think even in newspapers, there's probably only about five or six, half a dozen newspapers in the entire world that uh, makes any meaningful money out of, uh, out of the internet or about, out of apps because there's so much around, it's, you, you can get it elsewhere for nothing. Uh, and I think that's part of the problem with, um, with podcasts now, which is the same music solved that problem. And I think podcasts will as well. They need to have uh, unusual, uh, unique uh, content that uh, you can't get anywhere else. Therefore, you can charge for it. Um, and I think that hasn't happened quite yet. At least I haven't found one. <laughs> Um, from your perspective, what role do media companies have in the midst of a public health or other emergency? Do you see them as playing a part in serving the greater good by investing in public service shows, messaging and elevating experts? Almost oh, certainly. Uh, I mean, the only reason the media exists is for the public. Um, and if, that's, if they're not broadcasting, disseminating, uh, publishing in the public interest, uh, the public will lose interest for a start. Uh, I think uh, in, in Britain with, uh, with Ofcom uh, public service licenses for uh, the likes of uh, ITV and the BBC and so on, one of the reasons why they get special privileges uh, is because uh, they get special privileges in their allocation of bandwidth and their allocation of EPG numbers and so on because they are uh, required to provide those kind of services in the public uh, so in the public interest that doesn't happen in the states it doesn't happen in in most other places um, where commercial operations consider it uh, in their commercial best interest to do the same thing so it's important that it happens for society but it's also um, fortunate that the best interests of society are the best interests of the media that's serving it. Thanks. We'll go to live questions now. We've got one from Cecile Demailly. I hope I've pronounced your name properly. Um, what do you think? What do you think of so-called information media who turn to be editors debating and don't provide news, i.e., something we learn, but opinions? Our information channels in France are slowly moving towards this direction, depleting quality. Is it a trend and where can one find real information? Well, quite often, thank you for that question. It's a very good question. Uh, we, as I mentioned before, if uh, even just by multiplying the uh, number of people now living in London, we would have by comparison that they had back in the 1750s, 740 news outlets. Uh, and we have about 740 news outlets, which means that many of, and, and an increasing number, which means that a lot of organizations that were there first primarily just to uh, give the news or balance the news are now finding that uh, people by the, the main time for the news in Britain is uh, on um, mainstream television is 10 p.m. People have lost, the, the operators, the media have long known that by the time people sit down at 10 p.m. to uh, watch the news, they already know what the news is because uh, of the 24, the alleged 24 hour news cycle, because of uh, apps and web pages and all the other ways that people now know what's, if they're interested in what's, uh, what's happening, they will know what's happening uh, because it's not very hard to find out what's happening, unlike back in those days. Uh, back in those days, of course, Reuters was still using carrier pigeons. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, so what people increasingly, if, the, if, the, if it's the case that people already know what the news is, or there are lots of other news outlets, uh, that many of the traditional news outlets feel, feel that their position in providing the news has been usurped by technology. 
uh, by ubiquitous um, opportunities to find out what's happening. Uh, so it's their job to put some uh, perspective uh, into, uh, into what's happening, to give people uh, some, um, uh, some basis of understanding what it is. So the, the old precepts of uh, journalism were who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, and I think for a long time, we were very good at who, what, when, where. Uh, the why was difficult because uh, it required um, some estimates of uh, that you couldn't balance. In fact, um, you know, I was taught as a young journalist that uh, you couldn't say a, um, a General Motors car, a VW crashed with a uh, with a Chevy, because that would indicate that the VW was at fault. We were taught to say a VW and a Chevy came into collision. Because that didn't—that uh, was the kind of balance uh, for various reasons, but uh, even from the point of view of the drivers, that was the kind of balance that was uh, put into us. So it's—it um, didn't actually it didn't help with the 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 why question, which I think mainstream media is doing more of now, uh, because the traditional role of the first four of um, uh, they've gone past. Is this, does that help answer the question or did I get off the subject? No, that sounded fabulous. Thank you both, Sarah. Um, we've got another question here from Martin Plant. Hi, Martin. Uh, hi, John. Given the seemingly inexorable requirement for audiovisual owners to provide digitally connected platforms in order to deliver more bespoke and relevant audiences for advertisers, do you feel the existing linear broadcasters, ITV, Channel 4 and Channel 5, have longevity or will Amazon buy them, especially for their content? Ah, uh, possibly. Um, it, it'd be a short-term thing. I was reading uh, a report, an American report, but we're normally, uh, and this is not a matrix trick, it's, it's true, we're normally, as far as media trends are concerned, we're normally about three years behind the States, that uh, linear viewing uh, to the networks uh, is holding up uh, in the States only because uh, people have got nothing else to do because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, that what is expected to happen is that uh, viewing uh, to traditional linear broadcast television will continue to decline uh, over the next few years. But the video on demand, as it's called, uh, streaming from Amazon, etc., cetera, uh, will continue to increase. Uh, now you'll notice that um, Channel 5, uh, Channel 4, uh, Channel 3, the BBC, the mainstream um, broadcasters in Britain have all multiplied themselves into ITV2, BBC4, uh, there was BBC3, and then they came back again and just put it on the internet. Uh, there is um, Channel 5 is part of a whole platform of uh, CBS, Viacom channels and so on. So they, which are also offering uh, ITV have gone in with the BBC to a thing called Britbox, which will provide um, uh, so-called um, box sets. And so, so yes, the answer is yes, and the answer is they can see it, and the answer is it's happening. Uh, and the closer that uh, ITV comes to uh, a, a dip in revenues, which isn't caused by uh, the pandemic, but is caused by the natural disappearance of uh, audience numbers to box set viewing and VOD viewing, the more their advertising revenue will fall, um, which means they would be cheaper to buy, uh, which uh, a lot of people are looking at. Um, the, the, it's, um, it is something that the, um, the matrix tells us will happen, yes. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, another one here from Mustin Laffer. Hi, Mustin. Thanks for joining us. Um, how do you factor surveillance capitalism into the matrix media? Uh, I would need a definition of matrix. Of uh, what was it? Observance capitalism. Surveillance. Surveillance. Capitalism. I'd need a definition of what it is. I don't know. How did a great answer on public service, this is from Michael Stereznich. 
how did some countries, USA where I watch lately, forget the historic record and possibility of public service campaigns in COVID? I've seen zero. Uh, I can't answer for where you were watching. Uh, the, a lot of what I've seen of America- Applying to the USA, I think, here. The pardon? Applying to the USA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have seen a lot of uh, public service announcements. Again, I go back to the answer he gave a few moments ago, that the media that wants to be relevant to the community and be part of the community, and I'm talking here primarily about local television, there are no networks in the United States without local channels because they all operate on the local channels. Uh, so to talk about what the networks are doing in network time is not to say what television in the United States is doing uh, because even a lot of that network time belongs to the local stations. They were uh, very heavily, from what I've seen, um, very heavily running uh, campaigns uh, on, uh, on COVID. Uh, on wearing masks uh, and so on. Um, I, if you watch the output of the national networks, that may not be the case because they, I can't answer for them, but I would believe that they would say, this is up to the local channels to do, and that's not passing it off. Um, more people, I mean, the, there was at one stage, you may remember the American ABC network had a catchphrase, more Americans get their news from ABC than from any other source. Now, that wasn't because of the networks that we see here. It was because they had more views to local news on their local stations than they did to their network news. So I think when you look at, uh, when you look at an organization, when you look at a country, you've got to look deeper into their uh, media um, structure rather than um, be the, the superficial um, uh, snapshot of... Uh, of what you might see. Thank you. We've got time just to squeeze in one last question. We've only got a couple of minutes left. We've got a question from Joanne Flynn. Hi, Joanne. Hi, um, Jo. Where do you scenario the regulatory side of the internet as a publisher stroke editorial force? 15 to 10 years out, what would you future cast? Well, the main thing about even though we've been talking about the world and global oper um, operations here, uh, basically we're talking about, as I was saying just, uh, just before with American uh, television, we're looking at uh, individual uh, countries, individual regions within countries, uh, which will make the difference. I mean, um, Germany is an example that has uh, regionalized uh, media uh, policies. Uh, rather than uh, one big uh, federal uh, policy. Um, so it depends on, I, you know, I, I would think that at the moment in Burma, uh, the media matrix is operating in the reverse S fashion, and it will for some time. Um, in, uh, in India, it's, um, there is in fact a lot more government uh, intervention in um, freedom of speech than they would appear to be on the outside. Uh, it depends on exactly which country you're in. Uh, certainly in, uh, in Russia, uh, that reverse S uh, is becoming stronger and stronger. Um, in China, it's always been there. There did appear a stage where it looked like it was loosening and then it really tightened up again. So Joe, I think the answer is it depends on where you are. Uh, as to what government is um, enforcing or uh, reducing what regulations um, or uh, how well the media can uh, uphold itself with the community to say, no, no, don't do that. We think this is too precious or too important for you to get your uh, grubby fingers all over it. I'm afraid that is uh, all the time we've got for questions. Um, I'm sorry to, to those people who's, whose questions we haven't been able to put. Um, just want to say a huge thank you, John, for joining us today and for delivering a fascinating lecture, answering so many questions as well. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Um, please remember that we've got two more lectures to come in the series this term. You can either register online via the um, college website on the events page but we'll also be sending out information to you on how to register so many thanks again 
and stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.